Welcome to the interview, Blair. Let, real pleasure having you here today. I wanted to broadly split this into three sections. First, to talk about capitalist power, then to talk about inflation, and then a little segment on your approach to bringing the revolutions in evolutionary biology into economics. So the first question I had for you was that, you know, capitalist power, which is a great book that I'm going to link in the description, um, is a radical approach to the political economy that conceives capital as a symbolic quantification of power. Can you break down some of the main arguments from the book and what the authors claim that mainstream and also a little bit of heterodox economics gets wrong? Sure. Uh, well, it starts with the question that maybe seems a little bit arcane, but the question of what is capital? Uh, we all know we live in a capitalist society, but not a lot of people think about what they actually mean when they say capital. And so in the book, Capital as Power, Jonathan Nitzen and Shimshon Bickler uh, set out to basically rethink um, political economy, starting with the idea of capital. And going back a century um, to really some, the, the two fundamental schools of thought in economics, which are Marxism and the neoclassical, uh, neoclassical economics, which just for most people is just economics. That's what you learn in, in Econ 101. Mm -hmm. Both of these schools think of capital as uh, two things fundamentally. It's, it's machines and infrastructure, capital goods, and then under that, uh, and, and then uh, in addition to, to kind of the real side, there is um, a monetary value. And, they, and these schools set out to explain where the value comes from. And Marx famously, famously said, look, the value comes from labor time, um, essentially. Um, the more labor is embodied in a commodity, uh, the more value it should have. And then after Marx uh, came the uh, marginalists, so the neoclassical um, school, who said, "No, it's not uh, labor time; it's it's utility, and um, you derive basically consumers drive satisfaction from consuming a product, and we measure that in terms of marginal utility. So ultimately, the value of capital, whatever your capital good is." has to ultimately boil down to the utility it provides. And so that's the, the gist of these two schools of thought which dominate the discussion. And the problem is always to then tie the value of, of capitalization, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the value of capital goods back to hmm. um, you know, these fundamental units. And, you get into all kinds of problems because you look at the stock market, for instance, and it, you know a, a company like um, Apple is worth how many? I, I don't even keep track, but several trillion dollars now. Yeah, the market cap's probably over a trillion. Yeah. Yeah, it's mark. So, and but what does it own? It doesn't. You know, it Apple doesn't manufacture its own computers. It doesn't really own factories. That's mm -hmm. all subcontract. Apple mostly owns intellectual property. Same with Microsoft, same with all big tech companies. And so you get this uh, result where these companies are, are worth billions, sometimes trillions on the stock market, but it's hard to see what they own. And so Marxists then will say, well, look, the, the stock market is fictitious. It's, it's not real capital. Uh, and then the neoclassical economists uh, basically really try to tie this to utility. But the problem is, and this is the main critique in capitalist power is that neither of these schools um, can measure what they claim to measure. They can't, you can't measure um, Marx's idea of labor time. It's called uh, socially necessary abstract, abstract labor. That's a unit that doesn't exist. Same with utility, you can't observe utility. Uh, so these are all basically theories with no way to find evidence to back them up. And so along come 
Nitzan and Riffler, and they say that the problem is this, this duality. You're trying to explain um, monetary value, say capitalization, in terms of some um, underlying unit. And this duality, they think, is going the entirely the wrong direction. They say there's no, it doesn't matter what um, Apple owns, if it owns anything at all. What matters is that its power. So the, the Apple earns, Apple is worth or valued at a trillion dollars on the stock market because it has the power to earn an income stream. And it does that through intellectual property. Um, and so it's this, these property rights that Nixon and Bickler say is fundamental. And this is property rights are fundamentally negative, which means that they're not um inherently productive it's about exclusion so the thing that apple can do is exclude anybody who wants to make an apple like computer and slap a apple logo on it they can exclude you from doing that um, so it's this exclusionary power that allows apple to earn an income stream and capitalization then is just a outcome of this power and they go as far as to say it is literally a measurement of of a company's power. So that's the, the name of their book, Capital as Power. Capital is a symbolic measure of power. Um, yeah, I, I really, I really like that because um, you know, one of the things, so I'm, you know, I'm I'm on the financy side of things, but you know, one of the, the, the things that you bring up uh, in, in your articles and stuff is is the kind of discount rate. Um, that capitalists use uh, for, you know, discounting uh, cash flows into their present value. And, you know, it's, it, it really is out of thin air. Like what do you, what, what are your kind of views on that that you've already expounded on in articles before, but could you, could you break that down for us now? Well, um, yeah. So the, the, uh, we should back up a bit and say that there's a formula for, for capital. A mm -hmm. lot of people, especially in the left have the, the idea that the stock market moves just kind of unpredictably um, in all sorts of directions. And it's just, the numbers really don't have any, um, they're not tied to anything. And in the short term, that is kind of true. There's a lot of just randomness that nobody understands. But in the long term, the stock market has a very predictable pattern. And that is um, companies are valued um in relation to their earnings so if apple and, and there's a formula to do this so you take say apple maybe apple has annual earnings of a hundred billion dollars by earnings that's the the way that uh finance people that's the word for profit so they have earnings of a hundred billion dollars and you take that uh earning and you discount it so you divide by some discount rate which is percentage and, and this number could be anything, uh, but this is uh, basically a ritual. And that's what the word that uh, Nitzan and Bickler use is this is a ritual, just like any other ritual that you'd find in um, you know, religion or any um, other culture that we would look at and say, look, these people are, are doing this uh, behavior over and over. They do it together. They learn from one another. What does it really mean? Does it have any physical meaning not really it's just something that they do so this is the ritual of capitalization and it involves picking a discount rate which is a is a measure of or a statement of um certainty or uncertainty about the future so if you're very uncertain about the future if you are scared or fearful of the future you would discount steeply which means you are um you basically want to make all your money now and get out. If you think that the future is certain and your income stream will last a long time, then you discount at a lower rate. And there are, there's herd behavior. So capitalists tend to discount historically in the US at around, I think, I can't remember the exact number. I think it was about 7%. Yeah, I think in, in the article it was about, yeah, 7%. 7 or 8, yeah, yeah, yeah. why yeah. that is. Uh, You'd have to ask them. I don't really know. It doesn't have any physical meaning. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, but that so it's very like the stock market in 
aggregate terms is very simple. You just look at the earnings of these companies and take some standard discount rate, and that's the capitalization of the stock market. Mm -hmm. um, but then you have to explain where earnings come in, and that's a whole other uh, side of it that should be explained. Yeah, fair enough. So I think you know, one, one of the things that you mentioned in the question before this is that you know stock markets seem to be like heavily delineated from reality and move in very inexplicable ways in the short term because it you know seems to be based on these ex expectations of future cash flows. Um, so one of the questions that people on our team had was, do you, do you see this as kind of analogous with what is going on you know with like cryptocurrency, but with the caveat that you know at least uh, an equity has some underlying value to it in terms of you know capital goods and a percent of ownership of that, but with you know crypto there's nothing. So I mean, I, how do you do you think you could tie those two concepts together in any way? Yeah, well, there's a this um, and okay, let's back up. There's a, this mm -hmm. fundamental idea that in in economics and in political economy that value has to be tied to something, and that when it's not tied to some aspect of production, there's something wrong. And the view that I take, um, which comes from capitalist power, is that that's the wrong angle. Value is, is about power. Value is fundamentally mm -hmm. about the power struggle going on within society. And that power struggle can play out through production of things, but it doesn't have to. So you can have a power struggle just over property rights, never mind what those rights do or, or about. And so crypto, kind of like any form of mon money is like the, the most abstract form of of property rights you can mm -hmm. take it and buy anything with it so cryptocurrencies are they're not a generalized currency but it's just a it's a look at what the those the movement of these currencies and who who understands them i don't but it's a it's a power struggle between the owners of the various uh currencies in the same way that um the movement of the stock market is a power struggle both mm -hmm. between the companies on the stock market and also between um, capitalists and workers. And so this is one of the most interesting aspects of capitalist power is that it gives you a new way of understanding the stock market. So people will say, well, look, the stock market is going up, but the economy is stagnant. Like it's just totally disconnected. Well, no, that, that it's not disconnected. That's the wrong angle. The stock market is about the power of capitalists. When it goes up, it means that capitalists are becoming more powerful relative to workers. So wages, I wrote a piece called um, stocks are up, wages are down. What does it mean? While stocks are up, that means capitalists are earning more. They're more powerful. Wages are down while workers have been beaten back. And so for 40 years in the United States and also in Canada, to slightly lesser extent, um, um, you know, unions have been beaten back, wages have stagnated, workers have lost a lot of their power. And the flip side of that is that capitalists, or the owners of big companies are more powerful than ever. So there's no disconnect. Mm -hmm. It's just that you have to look at the, the meaning of the stock market. And I think it's about power. So mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with what we're producing or how much of it we're producing. It has to do with how we're organizing the power structure of society and that for the last 40 years has been swinging towards more capitalist power but that can't go on forever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do, do you think there's kind of an ingenuity in it um that capitalists have hitched on this kind of solidification of their own power with how like for example in canada like all our, our, our pensions are you know they, they hinge on how the market moves is it um, is, 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 it, is, it, is, it, is it, do you think it's like a cool strategy they've done is to, you know, put the, the, the future value of our earnings hitched to how they perform and how much power, power they get to, you know, solidify? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to blame everything on a cabal of capitalists, <laughs> but, um, you know, our whole society buys into, for the most part, the idea, the ideology of capitalism. That's what makes us live in a capitalist society. If it was only, you know, a tiny elite who bought into the ideology, it wouldn't, it wouldn't last long. You know, regimes, mm -hmm. be it uh, feudalism or, or whatever, 
most people either have to be apathetic or buy into it somewhat. And I think we've bought into this idea that the way to pay for people to retire is to you know, invest in the stock market. Mm -hmm. And you, if you want to back up, like what is, um, you know, retirement, all it is is somehow um, members of society are supporting people who are old. You don't mm -hmm. have to think about money. Literally, we're taking um, the resources, um, you know, produced and harvested by younger people and giving a portion of them to older people. How you mm -hmm. want to finance that, like you don't need a stock market to finance that. You can literally just, um, for instance, the government of Canada is fiscally sovereign. It could literally just say, we're going to pay for everyone's pension. Mm -hmm. We don't even need to finance it. We'll just spend the money. Mm -hmm. And then um, if we want to tax accordingly, if we're scared of inflation or whatever, they can. And, and, and it's done. So, um, but we don't do that for the most part. I mean, we have a meager pension in Canada, uh, but most people depend on on the pension from their job. And that is, again, getting invested in, in the stock market because, because capitalism, because that's, uh, that's the way people think. And if mm -hmm. the government is not willing to step up, there's not, there's not much alternative because, um, you know, private uh, firms don't have um, the ability to create money, banks mm -hmm. aside. But, um, but th it's ultimately a question of um, the ideology that, that organizes society. Mm -hmm. And it, it, essentially we can, you know, fund this kind of consumption smoothing over somebody's lifetime in any way that we choose. And it's just, you know, we've just happen to tie it uh, to yeah. how the stock market works. And, and yeah. the funding, this is the one of the things that I wrote about in, in my book, is that the funding problems get all the attention, but they're not really, um, they're not a fundamental problem. Like we always say, oh, we don't have enough money. Well, not having enough money is literally the only thing that can't be a problem because we create money. We can create as, as much of it as we want anytime we want. Now the distribution of it can be a problem, but mm -hmm. not having enough money, say, to pay for pensions, can't be a problem. It could be a problem, for instance, that that the living standard of retirees times the number of retirees is just too much to handle. Especially, say, if we have a massive contraction in the economy, like we opt for like a degrowth economy, uh, and yet pensioners are tied into a very high standard of living. It would be literally impossible to support them. And that's a fundamental, that's a problem, uh, mm. but that's not a finance problem. It may appear mm. that way, but it's a, it's a problem of literally having enough goods to support a certain portion of the society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more to do with like the real economy of what's going on. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you kind of brought up inflation because that moves us into the second topic. You've uh, written, uh, you know, a lot about inflation. You repudiate a lot of the reasons that the kind of existing orthodoxy gives for inflation. You know, the most famous being Friedman's um, inflation is everywhere and yeah. always a monetary phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about it more as a restructuring of the social order and the differential of power between uh, kind of existing corporations. Can you can you delve into this uh, a little bit for us? Sure. Well, let's back up with the with Milton Friedman and mm -hmm. his famous doctrine that it's called the quantity theory of money. And if you yeah. look, if, there, if prices are going up, there has to be more money in the economy. And nobody disagrees with that. Uh, but then he, his claim was that it, it's the quantity of money that causes inflation. And that is uh, very disputable. Mm -hmm. it, so the cause and effect of this is completely, uh, I think he's got it totally backwards. But let's back up a bit. Everybody, including Milton Friedman or every mainstream economist, just looks at the average price level. And if the average price level goes up, they say, look, there's inflation. And if you back up a bit and say, well, why should I even care about the average price level? Because if you lump in, say, wages with that, if, if, if the value of everything or the price of everything is increasing uniformly, Nobody would care. Tomorrow, everything costs double, but I earn double. Everybody else is in the same boat. Nothing changes. Um, 
And so the only reason we care about inflation is if it's differential, meaning it, it varies uh, between uh, commodities and between people. So the, the most recent piece I wrote about that was just showing how much oh, um, since 2020, since that's when inflation has become a hot button topic. But since then, how varied inflation has been between different commodities. So some uh, commodities are actually, their price is going down. Some are, are have doubled or tripled. Uh, so the, it's all over the map. And so the effect of this inflation, number one, depends on what you want to buy. And number two, it means that inflation benefits people, different uh, people in different ways. So some companies, if they're in, able to inflate the price of their uh, what they produce faster than others, they win. So inflation is really a struggle. It's a struggle to redistribute income by changing prices rather than um, often the way economists view the economy is a struggle to outproduce somebody or to sell more stuff. Uh, well, this is the flip side of it. You can also compete by just raising your prices. And there are always in win winners and losers when you do that. And a very, um, I think, shocking result from, that's, that's in capitalist power. So Nitzan Bickler looked at um, uh, the differential profitability of, so that's a big word, they looked at the profitability of big firms and mm -hmm. compared it to the profitability of small firms. And they found that when inflation increases, big firms became more profitable in relative terms. In other, and, and so the, what that means is that it implies these big companies are able to raise prices faster than small companies to their own benefit, to the benefit of their bottom line. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is not well known. It's certainly not talked about outside the mainstream, but it really is the whole point of inflation, which is that it, it, it redistributes income. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of, the, one of the things you talked about in another article was, was the fact that, you know, um, the markets that we do have currently don't work like the hypothetical markets that, you know, economists have in their mind, uh, in, in so far as that, you know, companies are able to administer that pricing without really seeing a huge loss in revenue. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit and why they're able to pull off this kind of differential? Yeah, well, in mainstream economics, there's this fairy tale called perfect competition, and it's used to derive everything about economic theory. So everything you learn in Econ, in econ 101 is derived, although you're not told this, is derived mm -hmm from this idea of perfect competition. And, and what that means to economists is that firms are price takers. So they literally take the price from the market. You have no ability to set your own price. Uh, that's not how it works in the real world. Of course, there are some small businesses that don't really have any power to set their price, but there are some big players that really administer their own prices. And in that word, administered prices, uh, dates back to, to the 1930s to an economist called Gardner Means, mm -hmm. who looked at, um, he was looking at the Great Depression and he saw the kind of two different types of, of industries. In one industry, in response to the Great Depression, they did what economists said they should, which is um, lower their prices, right? If you can't sell your product, supply and demand, uh, Econ 101 says you should lower your prices. And that's what this sector did. And then, but mean, Gardner Means found this other sector, which didn't cut prices at all. They literally just held them constant because they had the power to do that. And they cut output instead and held prices constant. Um, so this was uh, a famous result and he called it administered prices. So it's everywhere. Anytime you have big companies like Walmart, um, you name it, any large company, they are, they're setting their prices and they often collude with their so-called competitors to set prices. And every, every now and then they get caught, but not very often. Uh, and especially if there's a total monopoly, there's nothing to catch because there's no collusion. Mm -hmm. You literally just pick the price that you want. So um, 
the real world looks nothing like an economics textbook. There is no free market. Um, there is a power struggle. So companies, most companies can't charge anything they want. Um, but there's a struggle between companies and consumers, different companies. Uh, how that plays out, uh, very complicated question, but Econ 101, supply and demand curves, intersecting supply and demand curves tells you nothing about it, literally nothing. Hmm. No, I agree. I think it's a, uh, it's a, the, the, you, you look at the kind of models you learn in Econ 101 and when you when you think beyond it with you know some kind of mathematical underpinning it it makes no sense we use like an unobservable kind of measure of utility to derive basically everything and that you know makes no sense and we say you know this is the laws of how the world you know the economic world is going to work and how our interactions are going to be governed but you say well okay hold on a second it's not really based on any real quantity it's just this fairy tale of utility um but anyway i think one, one of the questions i had uh, about this was like okay so how much in like, what is the extent of pricing being administered in the current world that uh, we live in? Well, nobody really knows. And, that, and in a sense, that's, it assumes you can kind of uh, place on a scale between, uh, you know, a, a perfectly competitive market and a perfectly uncompetitive market and administered prices. And that's very difficult to do. Um, I don't even know if that's possible. What people, who, capitalist power researchers, what they have been able to do is look at certain case examples and try to tease out uh, how and why some prices beat uh, or raise, rise faster than others at, at certain points. But I'm not sure that you can give a number to, to how much a price is administered. Um, but I would assume that, you know, abstractly, it would just kind of be proportional to the, the concentration of the particular sector. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, these, these kind of questions, it's a very good question, but, and it's a kind of question that tends to not be asked in economics. So we don't really have a lot of answers. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's totally fair. I mean, you know, what kind of economists would want to research into that, that, that would kind of deconstruct their whole model. Um, but anyway, so now I want to move into the portion where I, you know, I ask about a little bit about the, your work and the, you know, the book you've written, which is titled Rethinking Economic Growth Theory from a Biophysical Perspective. Um, what is this? And I'm, I'm very sorry for being very pedestrian about this. because I, I have no knowledge about this, but like, can you explain how you kind of um, connected this, this revolution that you saw in evolutionary biology to economics and what uh, your sort of thesis is about? Yeah, uh, let's see. Well, so the book, Rethinking Economic Growth Theory from a Biophysical Perspective, uh, it really stemmed, stemmed out of an interest actually in, in peak oil dating back probably 15 years. And I got interested in economics right around the time that there was a lot of interest in peak oil. And I, so I got very interested in, in energy and and trying to connect um, economics to energy consumption, because energy is ultimately what, what drives all, all human societies and really all life. Uh, mm. And so that book, uh, which I wrote actually during my, when I was doing my PhD, was really an attempt to, first of all, debunk the neoclassical theory of economic growth, which, by the way, it, uh, doesn't even look at natural resources. They don't care about natural resources at all. So I really tried to A, debunk that theory and then try to come up with a, a better way of thinking about the material economy, which I use the word biophysical. So thinking about how flows of energy primarily relate to um, the rest of the structure of society. Um, so that book wasn't particularly about human evolution, I got more interested in, in evolution uh, later on. But one of the, uh, I should um, say that one of the interesting results in that book that I developed more on was this idea, was this finding that, that 
firms and governments tend to get bigger as we consume more energy. So like this, a basic part of industrialization is a trend towards bigness. Uh, and so I've gone on to tie that to, to hierarchy. And then from hierarchy, then I started to really get interested in evolution. Uh, but it kind of all started with this, this idea, like where does hierarchy come from? And um, I think I got the idea from Peter Turchin, who said, well, hierarchy is the solution to an organizational problem. And humans have, you know, biological limitations in our ability to, to have um, maintain social relations. Uh, like you can maybe have 100 friends, you can't have 10,000 friends. And yet, we've got um, companies now with millions of employees. Walmart, I think, has 2 million employees. How, how do they organize? They, they don't all talk to everybody else every day. So hierarchy is the solution to this organization problem because there's a nested chain of command. And in that chain of command, you only really need to, to um, have a social relation with your superior and your subordinates, if you have subordinates. Um, mm -hmm. So from there, if you want to talk more about my ideas about um, income distribution and evolution, you can go into that. But I, I'm, mm -hmm. I come from economics from the standpoint that it ought to be integrated with the natural sciences, which means A, like physics and thermodynamics, and B, biology, evolution. Uh, if you can't do that, what's the point? Because mm -hmm. we know we're, a, we're, we're an evolved species that obeys the laws of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. Anything further that you, that you do with economics has to be consistent with that starting point. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 we kind of want more realist models than the kind of instrumentalist stuff that we've uh, been been fed by the orthodoxy. But I, I would love to get into, you know, whatever your, your thoughts are on income distribution and, you know, the evolutionary history of human beings. Yeah, well, so I think that the intellectual heritage of, of economics and really political economy um, just kind of got it. I got a lot of things wrong from the beginning because the discipline started at a weird time. Um, first of all, it, feel, it really arose to explain capitalism. And so political economists took it as their starting point to explain um, capitalist relations and property rights. And, and for the most part, I mean, Marx wanted to un go under the hood, but that was their starting point. They didn't want to say, explain hunter-gatherer societies, you know, agrarian societies, uh, or societies without money. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas anthropologists have been interested in the whole continuity, and, and, and especially when they take an evolutionary perspective. So by focusing on markets and, and um, competition, I think that economists got it wrong. So. One of the most interesting ways to look at human relations and, and how human societies organize is to use this idea of um, multi-level selection or group selection. And uh, the person who's written the most about this is a biologist named David Sloan Wilson. Mm -hmm. So in uh, evolutionary biology, a lot of people have bought into the, the selfish gene theory that everything you have to explain everything in terms of the selfishness of individuals which ultimately boils down to the selfishness of their genes and any kind of group behavior ultimately ties back to selfishness also and multi-level selection is a very different way of looking at evolution and really tries to explain sociality and altruism which is that look we have Organisms like ants, which organize in very altruistic ways, it's, it it's very difficult to tie that back to the selfishness of the individual. And you can, but we can go into all sorts of um, uh, theoretical loops about this. But what the multi-level selection says is, look, there's different, there's different selective forces. And 
at the individual level, uh, the forces are different than at the group level. So selfishness um, is good for individuals, but it's not necessarily good for groups of individuals. So the, the famous slogan is that um, within groups, selfish individuals uh, beat altruistic individuals, right? If you're in it, if you're a psychopath and you're in it for your own mm -hmm. gain, you're gonna beat the nice guy within a group. But between groups, altruistic groups beat selfish groups, right? So a group of psychopaths is kind of not a group at all. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine an army of psychopaths, they're all in it for their own gain. When they confront a giant unified army that charges, they all run for the hills to try to save themselves and they lose. So that's the idea that I think we should use to interpret human history and, and economic development. It's this um, struggle between uh, selfishness at the individual level, which no one denies exists, and altruism, which helps unify groups. So one of the ideas that I have is that human institutions, one way of looking at them is, is, at, is that they suppress selfishness in different ways. So, um, you know, economists started looking at society assuming that market competition was the default mode of, of uh, competition. But why should that be, right? Why, why if, I, if I can, um, why would I buy something on the market if I can just take it? So I think theft, you should look at human society as um, an all out war, of groups against groups. And that's kind of what uh, the evidence suggests, right? Primates in, in general are a, a very violent species, mm -hmm. intergroup violence, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and when you look at our history, uh, warfare is the norm. So, and Peter Turchin again has written a lot about this, that the, the norm for human competition is violent warfare between groups. So, Come along with a market. What is a market? Well, it's not a way to foster competition. A market is actually a way to suppress it. So rather than my group going and killing your group and taking your stuff, mm -hmm. we have a market. That's a way of suppressing war, basically. So now we trade on the market. We're suppressing competition. Whereas economists mm -hmm. look at it and say, look, you're, you're fostering competition. I No, you're suppressing violent competition. Same with firms. What is a firm? A firm is totally mysterious in economics, even though they accept its existence. But if markets are so um, ideal, why isn't everything on the market? Like, why don't I, I walk into, uh, if you go to work at, at um, McDonald's, say, why don't you bid on every job? Bid on every hamburger patty that if you're going to make hamburgers, right? Mm. That's not how it works. You go to McDonald's, you, you uh, and you're told what to do. You you may be uh, competed to get the job on a market, but once you're in McDonald's, you get a wage and you get told what to do. That's uh that's a, so inside firms firms suppress the market. That's more suppression of competition comp a competition. Mm -hmm. So then they use hierarchy within firms. Um, and this in terms of group selection is ways of suppressing competition within groups so that the group is more altruistic and can beat out other groups. Uh, so that's kind of my grand theory of how we should look at um, human social evolution in terms of um, mm -hmm. evolutionary theory. That, that's, that's really interesting. I've never, I've, I've never heard about something like that. It's really, really cool to hear. Um, I mean, especially because, I mean, the creed of, you know, so-called market economists is that, okay, well, even if everybody acts selfishly, it will, this market is kind of this heuristic mechanism that will lead us to, you know, the, the maximal utility, like the maximal um, benefit as a group. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. That's not necessarily the case, right? Um, so I guess the, the, the final question that we like asking everybody on the show is that if there is one aspect of so-called like Blair fixed thought that you would like to beam into, you know, the public's collective consciousness, like what would that thought or idea be? Mm. Uh, sure. Well, to me, it would be, uh, if you want to understand 
um, income inequalities. We've been talking about the stock market, but let's back up kind of a bigger picture, including the stock market, but also all incomes. If you want to understand income inequality, you ought to look at power, number one. And more specifically, I think you ought to look at hierarchy. So I've spent the last six or seven years researching hierarchy in all different angles of it, and specifically how its role in driving income inequality. And in, in some sense, this is um, common knowledge. Everybody knows that CEOs earn often hundreds, hundreds of times the average worker. And, so, and many people also know that that's gone up, right? And, uh, 60 years ago, CEOs in big firms earned maybe 10 times the average worker. Now they earn like somebody like Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. If you take into account their stock options, they're going to be earning thousands of times more than the average worker. Uh, this is fundamentally about hierarchy. The only reason people like that are able to earn so much is that they sit at the top of a hierarchy and they have the power to really affect their income. Uh, and so what I've been able to show, what I've been um, researching and, and able to show is that it's not just people at the top, but all the way through hierarchies, big firm hierarchies, there's this gradient of income as you move up the hierarchy. And so for me, I think if you're interested in income inequality, then you ought to be putting the focus on hierarchy because hierarchy is the source of the problem. It has benefits, but its single um, most uh, de deleterious effect is that it, it leads to despotism, right? Hierarchy by definition concentrates power at the top. And people at the top inevitably use that power for their own gain. Um, so that we should expect that to happen. So forget about markets, forget about like, um, you know, pay indicating per, a person's contribution to society. Mm -hmm. Their income, your income is largely a function of your power. Mm -hmm. And uh, the number one way to get power is to sit at the top of a big hierarchy and mm -hmm. uh, be despotic. And, and honestly, when we talk about feudalism, Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that a feudal lord, why, why do they earn so much more than the peasants? Well, they earn that because they're the, at the top of the hierarchy. There's no other reason. They have the power to, to dominate other people. Well, the same thing is true. The exact same thing is true in capitalism. It's just that always throughout human history, uh, in, the, in the power structure that you live in, you always have a hard time recognizing the ideologies that legitimize it. So most people, many people just think, well, yeah, the CEO earns X amount more than I do. That's just the way it is. But that's not just the way it is. It all can be boils down to, to ideologies and power structures and the way that um, uh, we've legitimized the extreme pay of, mm -hmm. let's call them what they are, rulers, rulers of corporations. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, and as soon as you start to think in those terms, then it, the world looks very different. It's not about co competition. It's not about markets. It's about uh, domination and power. Mm -hmm. so those are my thoughts about what, uh, what people uh, can, useful ways of thinking about the world. No, that's 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 really good. I mean, yeah, that's a really like succinct way of kind of summing up the 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 breadth of things that we've talked about. Is it's you know it's just about power dynamics. I thank you for that. That was really um, interesting description. I'm sure our listeners are very excited to hear that. But yeah, that's all the questions that I had for you today. Just want to thank you for taking the time to do this. We really appreciate this. Yeah, well, my pleasure. <laughs>